Welcome, it's APEDIS Helsinki 2020 again, and here I have Eric Wild from Axway Catalyst, but before I let him loose, um, Eric, you were in the wild, wild somewhere uh, all last week. Can you share that with us? Yeah, sure. I was, I was in wild Switzerland, actually, in the mountains, so that was my first my first vacation, my first kind of leaving home after two months, and I was just, it was really good. It, I, I haven't been at home for this long in, I don't know, forever. So it was really good to just get out. So if, if you have the opportunity to get out at some point in time, just leave home for a couple of days, definitely go and do it. I think it's really, it's great for your head. It's great for just, you know, like re-energizing yourself and getting a little bit out of this um, lockdown. Um, blues maybe <laughs> yeah uh, i have to uh share a finnish word with you i want you to learn it it's called mökki höpere mökki höpere mökki höpere very good Mökki, um, mökki, mökki höpere. Yeah. yes uh that means that you you might have a cabin fever um and yes. i think that that kind of sums it up <laughs> that we might all be feeling so i'm very good uh very um uh, joy that you are over your Mökki um situation and you're going to lead us to this mastering API governance uh, topic instead. So go ahead, Eric, start your presentation. Okay, and thank, thanks for that word. I, I love it. Mökki I will try to remember it. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining and I want to talk a little bit about what I call mastering API governance. And just to give you a little bit of an idea what this is all about. Um, here is outline of my talk, little intro, and um, it's first very briefly about my background. So my name is Erik Wilde. I'm a computer scientist by training. I have worked in a variety of companies and most recently I am with X-Ways Catalyst team. And the Catalyst team at X-Way has the goal and the mission to help companies making good decisions in the API space. So a lot of companies are looking into APIs. There often are many expectations and also some insecurities around how to do APIs well, what to keep in mind, how to control the growth of APIs and so forth. And our mission is to help organizations do this journey safely and still effectively so that organizations can start doing APIs and they also can reap the benefits of APIs. We are a small team, we're distributed globally in, uh, in America, in Europe and in Asia. And our mission really is to make sure that people use APIs in a good way. Before I joined Xway, I was actually part of a a team that was called API Academy, and that was a team which was even smaller. And the last thing we did there was writing a book about continuous API management. And it still is something that is on my mind nowadays because it's still the space I'm working on. And it's this general idea or the general problem basically that a lot of organizations understand APIs and they understand the value of APIs, that APIs are good for exposing features, for connecting features, for building new value chains, but they often have problems or they have concerns about governance, the magic word governance. And governance is this magic word that means we're not sure exactly how on the one hand to allow teams to build all these API things but to still have some level of insight and control so that as an organization, we make sure that we create the most overall benefit for the organization. And that's the topic of my talk today. It's really this idea of governance and how to best do that. And the way how you can best do that is in my mind, really something that has three parts to it. One part is insights. So insights means you have to understand what's happening in your API landscape. This is how we called it in our continuous API management book. So your API landscape is the totality of all the, all the APIs that you're working with, all your own and even external ones. 
You also have to make sure that you always focus on interfaces because that's the real value proposition of APIs. They tell you the importance of APIs is to make sure that all you see and all you interact with and all you depend on is an interface. And that's sometimes hard to embrace, in particular when that's something where before you were really concerned with how to build a system, how to design the system, how to architect the system. And in the API space, it turns more into this ecosystem world. So focusing on interfaces is really important as well. And the last thing that I also want to talk about a little bit today is what, what I call nudging. The idea that on the one hand, I want my teams to be productive and effective. On the other hand, I also want them, or I try to use certain technologies. I try to follow, I try to make them follow certain patterns. So how can I do that in the best way? And nudging is this idea that you relax constraints as much as you can, but you still try to make sure that everybody kind of works, uh, not in the same way, but follows the same general ideas and principles and tries to accomplish the same goals. And nudging is a good way how you can do that. And let's start first with looking into insights. And we can do that very briefly by looking at what is API architecture all about? Why are APIs even interesting for so many organizations nowadays? And APIs really are interesting because they focus on what a certain capability is and know not how it is implemented, right? This idea that I want teams to have a certain autonomy to make decisions that they have to make so that they can improve their productivity. So for example, I can tell them, well, if you want to choose a different programming language, that's fine if you think that this is a more appropriate language for you to use. The other thing that's also important is I want to avoid hidden dependencies, meaning that if I use APIs, I want all of my dependencies to go through APIs because the idea of APIs is to decouple things, to pull them apart and still allow them to connect through APIs, but to pull them apart. And if I also have connections that are not APIs, but different, then I, I haven't really pulled them apart properly. Right. So it's important to always think about this, um, these hidden dependencies that you want to avoid. What you also want to get out of it is to make sure that teams can really deliver at, at a quick pace. And that is pretty much a direct result of these dependencies that you try to minimize. Because the fewer dependencies you have, the faster a team can move because they don't have to wait for others to get something done or to check whether something might break or all these kind of things, right? So, so your delivery speed really goes up. And in the end, why are you doing all of this, right? None of this really kind of creates value so far. It just changes things a little bit. But why you're doing all of this is if you get all these things right, if, then you can deliver more features, more products at a higher speed, meaning you can make customers more happy, you can react to market changes more quickly, you can react to competition more quickly. So that's the, the overall goal of, all, goal of all of this. And in order to do this, one thing that we always encounter when we talk to large organizations is they're worried about governance. So governance is this magical word that means somebody who often before API was in charge of really controlling how everything gets built, they now have to relax this a little bit and say, I'm not in charge anymore of how things get built. I'm in charge of what gets built and to make sure that our productivity gets as good as possible. But my goal is also to relax constraints and allow teams more freedom to for example, pick tooling, pick languages, pick whatever they need to get their jobs done. That's one of the things that APIs allow you to do. Now, if you do that, you still want a certain coherence. And that's kind of the fundamental problem of governance. On the one hand, you want freedom for the teams, some autonomy. On the other hand, you also want some coherence so that if you have 100 APIs in your organization, they don't all look completely different. 
So for example, you want to have a style guide that people are following. And then the question is, how can I do that? How can I now create this coherence without, on the other hand, making things as slow as they were before? And that's really sort of the, the holy grail of APIs. How do I get to this point where I create the coherence that I want, but I still have some positive results in terms of being faster with my feature development and products and so forth. And the way to do that is to carefully identify what are the important things that teams need to do across products. So what are the repeating tasks that they need to do? For example, they have to secure APIs, they have to test APIs, they have to do all these things that to some extent always are repeating tasks that are not really their main problem. It's just a problem related to getting API API stuff done. And then when I have identified these things, I can help teams to solve these problems quicker, improving their productivity. And in order for me to do this on a continuous basis, I also have to make sure that my landscape of APIs is built to develop and evolve over time so that I don't design myself into a corner that I can't get out again. And in order to do that, how do I do that in the way that I'm promoting here? And like I said there, I think there are three important things. Number one, insights. So what do I mean by insights? By insights, I mean very often when it comes to APIs, what you want to do is you want to build your API ecosystem so that it's built outside in, meaning that the APIs that you use, the APIs that you create, the APIs that you expose to others are always designed from the outside in. And if you do it this way, what happens is you can, for example, also live in heterogeneous worlds where not all your APIs are produced through the same infrastructure. So for example, you have different API gateways that often happens in organizations. Some organizations struggle with that because they have the assumption that all your APIs are always published in one gateway and then in one portal. But that can really be a big constraint that you put on yourself. The other way around, which is shown here on the right hand side, allows you to say, instead of assuming that all my APIs get published through the same mechanism, I build the visibility into my APIs as a separate layer. And then underneath, I have maybe several ways how my APIs get exposed because maybe I have different gateways, I have different technologies, I have different providers, I have even external providers. And if you do that, then you can have more insights into your APIs without having to mandate that everybody publishes their APIs on one technological platform that you have. And in order to do that, what you can do is you can label your APIs. Labeling your APIs is a very powerful idea. It's this idea that each API is a product in your organization and you can describe it and you can describe it in any way you like. You can describe everything that you need to know about an API and you can do that in a way that once you want to know more about your APIs, you can just go ahead and read the labels. So what labels are, are pretty much what labels are in the real world. They are metadata about APIs that allow you to gain insight to understand your APIs on a level that's necessary and important for you. So when you look at the real world, you see that there, for example, there are food labels and food labels have information about nutritional content and whatever organizations or governments said is important to know about food. There are other labels such as safety labels. So safety labels meaning, for, an, for example, for an API, a safety label could be something like this API manages personally identifiable information. So be careful. Make sure that whatever goes in there is something where you have the user's consent to actually go in there because otherwise we could be in legal trouble. So this whole idea of labeling APIs 
so that you then get insight into what your APIs are doing is the idea that I don't need to understand how all my APIs are functioning, but I need to understand what they're doing and what I need to know about them so that I can use them in a responsible and maybe legal way. Right? So this is something that is really important to make sure that your APIs are described at a level that matters for your API landscape. That's really the, the underlying story there. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about what is important for good API governance, the first one was insights, the second one is interfaces. And that means you really have to step back from the idea that you tell everybody how to do things, but you just tell them what they have to do. So the best way to do that in my experience is to step away from making rules how people have to do things. And in order to, to do that, you still want some governance, right? And, and then what you can have instead are constraints. So constraints would be the kind of overarching ideas where you say that there is a constraint that whatever you produce, this is what it has to look like. I don't really care how you produce it or how you implement it as long as it follows, as it satisfies those constraints. And the idea for those constraints is also that they should be as minimal as possible so that teams don't get, again, slowed down by the need to follow too many constraints. And that teams also have the freedom to pick their own solution when it comes to figuring out how to satisfy those constraints. And in order to do that, what's also important is to always look at your constraints every now and then and think about, do we still need that? Is that a constraint that really helps us? Or is it just a constraint that makes things slower without creating any value? And if that's the case, you can just throw it away and say, okay, we don't, we don't need that constraint anymore. So the more freedom you can give to teams, the more autonomy you can give to teams, the faster they will be able to deliver because they have fewer things that they have to worry about. What you should also do is help teams to satisfy those constraints, but that's a different thing. That's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. On the one hand, you have constraints, telling them what to do, and then you can also tell them how they can satisfy those constraints, but these are different things, where you can tell them this is a constraint that you have to satisfy, and here is one possible way of how you can do it. For example, you can say, you have to secure your APIs and here is a gateway that does it for you. So unless you want to create a new way how you can secure your API and prove to us that it's really secure, why don't you just use this gateway and things will work for you. And that's really the kind of the balance that typically works very well, where you look at the pain points that team experience, teams experience, and then you help them to get past those. And in order to do that, what you really try to do is you try to decouple teams as much as possible so that they have to satisfy as few constraints as they can. And also when teams are interacting, they're interacting just through these interfaces that they create and that they consume between each other. So again, what that means is that each team can move faster because they have fewer constraints to deal with and that makes them faster on their way when they have to just create their own product, which might have some dependencies to other products, but hopefully these are again, just dependencies through APIs. And that's really something that allows teams to have more autonomy and to move faster. And while that is a good thing to do, the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of, well, it's good that we have this ability for teams to move faster, but how can we help them to also maybe not reinvent the wheel the whole time? And that's the third thing that I want to talk about after the insights and the interfaces. Now we're at the nudging. And the nudging is that a little bit tricky thing where whenever you have smart people and you give them a problem, right? Sometimes smart people 
have this idea like, oh, that's an interesting problem. I want to work on that. On the other hand, a lot of smart people also say, oh, maybe there is an existing solution for this problem so I can spend time with other problems. And that is where nudging comes in. And one way I have always described that is um, engineering the engineers, which is why I have this wonderful picture of an engineer. And the idea really there is that what you try to do is you try to build an ecosystem where the engineers that you have, the teams that you have, are behaving in the most effective way for the organization. And in order to do that, what you can do is you have to make sure that your whole organization becomes more effective and it becomes better at changing. And you can do that by, in the end, nudging teams to use tools and support that you create for them. Such as, for example, putting out such an API gateway and telling them, well, one constraint that we have is you have to secure APIs because we don't want unsecured APIs. But here is a convenient way how to do this. Why don't you do it like this? And if that indeed is a convenient way, most teams will go this route because they probably don't feel like spending time on a problem that they don't have to spend any time with. And that kind of nudging really allows you to make teams faster, to also have a certain coherence to create this governance that they gravitate towards certain ways of solving repeating problems. And then it's your job to see, are there problems with what I've created? Is my nudging working? Or is it something where teams are still creating their own solutions because for some reason, the solutions that I have created and, and provide to them are not really satisfying their, their uh, requirements. And that, that is, I think, the tricky part and the really sort of the, let's say the art of being a good API landscaper is to find that balance between, on the one hand, giving autonomy to teams so that they can do what they're good at and to still make sure that you have a certain level of coherence, that you have can exercise some governance and also that you can create some synergies across all the teams by providing them with tooling by providing them with a platform they can build on and to constantly observe that platform, to improve that platform so that the platform becomes the, the productivity tool basically that all the teams can leverage. And with that, we're already done. So what I wanted to talk about was really this very simple idea in, in the end, I think that once you move to APIs, in my mind, the really important thing to keep in mind is if you build something that's based on APIs, you build an ecosystem. You don't build a highly integrated machine anymore. You try to pull things apart so that the individual pieces in your overall landscape can evolve more quickly, more, um, more independently, and so forth. So what you're building is an ecosystem. And it's really important to embrace this idea that what you're now dealing with is an ecosystem, it's not a system anymore. And in order to, to govern this ecosystem, to really help this ecosystem to be as productive as possible as the overall ecosystem, what I think you really need are these three things that I was presenting briefly today. On the one hand, you need to know what's going on. These are the insights into the things that make up your ecosystem. You also need to know how you can use things and you need to manage the dependencies between things. And these are the interfaces. So you have to make sure that interfaces are used in a disciplined way and are used in a way that really help you to, to utilize this idea of pulling things apart. And the third thing in this ecosystem world is you also have to make sure that individual bits and pieces in the ecosystems are built in the most productive way. And in order to do that, you can use this idea of nudging where instead of forcing everybody to do it the one right way, you 
entice people to do it in a certain way because you can help them, you can convince them that this makes them more effective. And then if what you are providing there indeed helps them, teams will definitely use your advice and will build on the platform that you provide them. And then you end up with your API landscape that has a good balance of diversity and autonomy, but still has some coherence and gives you, has some ability for you to influence how that landscape develops over time. And with this, I'm done. Thank you very much for, for being part of this. Um, you can find my slides online. You can also find me online. And um, I think now I'm handing it over to Mariuka again. Thank you, Eric. It was a very <clears throat> good presentation. And, and I, I kind of felt like I and a lot of the other people here in the conference, speakers at least, are these API landscapers, exactly as you described. But what do you see if, if somebody wants to become an API landscaper, um, what their background or what their skills should be and who is a good API landscaper? That's a good question. I think it depends where you come from, actually. So mm -hmm. if you kind of move up from being an API developer, more like focused on a product, and then you want to move up into the landscape, I think then what is required is that you kind of just reflect on what were the challenges that you had, what were the challenges maybe where you would have wished for better support, and what were maybe constraints that you thought were unnecessary that slowed you down. But if on the other hand you come down, which is also I think something that happens a lot where you have like former or enterprise architects who now want to kind of become APL landscapers. I think then the, har the hardest part there definitely is to give up some level of control where people had a lot of control, typically how they can mandate how everything is being done and giving up this control and telling people not so much anymore how they do stuff, but just what you expect from them. I think that's the most challenging um, let's say um, that's the skill. Yeah, that's the challenging skill basically to have there to give up this control and say, okay, you have more autonomy now. All I'm trying to do is make sure that we govern everything so that the end result is what we want to have. And I have to say that there are a lot of enterprise architects also in the audience <laughs> now that are uh, actually kind of trying to go here or, or finding themselves there. And I think that there is kind of this mix of how business oriented enterprise architect you have been, um, because you might find yourself doing much more business work <laughs> in, in yes. parsing up the ecosystem. But on the other hand, you might find yourself much more technically uh, challenged uh, when, when dealing with all these kind of uh, different teams and different tools and different terminology and, and, and networks and everything else. So it, it is a good uh, case of really looking into what needs to be coming. And I think that your, your presentation really gave the insights of kind of what is the job description, what you <laughs> should be doing and how you should be doing. That would be great. So, yeah, I think so. So thank you, Eric, for being able to join us virtually this time in Helsinki, hopefully again live someday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to be here. <laughs> <laughs>